This is We the Sales Engineers Podcast, show 250. Welcome to We the SES Podcast, the show for sales engineers by sales engineers with your host, Ramsey Majaba. What's up, SE Nation? Welcome back to another episode. I'm happy to have you here, and I'm happy to have a guest. And this is a special guest. I don't know how many of you know Anthony Palmozzi. He's been on the podcast before. He wasn't SC at the time. He struggled. He persevered. And he's been an SC for a while now, which I'm happy to see. Now, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. He actually ran into a lot of issues. He struggled quite a bit. And now he can say that he's an SC. He earned it. And we talk about those struggles. People come to me and say, like, hey, I want to be an SE. I want to be an SE in three months. And my thought was, interview process takes three months sometimes, sometimes more. So you're not going to get an SE job in three months, whether you're experienced or you're trying to break into the role. It takes a while. And Anthony's one extreme example. He had a lot to overcome. He didn't have any technical experience. So we talk about that. So let's jump in and see what Anthony has to say. Anthony Palmozzi, it's an honor. Nay, it's a privilege. Nay, it's what's better than a privilege. It's great to have you on the show as a fellow SE, as a brother in SE Nation. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Ramsey, so much for having me on the show. It's been quite some time since our last engagement here on YouTube. Super happy to be back and connecting with you. It, well, like we've been talking, like we haven't stopped talking since since we uh, you first thought, we first chatted. But having you here now as an SE, it just has a different taste to it. So I'm happy you're here. I'm happy I can have you here. And uh, for those who didn't watch the first video, which they should, they should go back and watch show 153, Dip Your Toes, Why Come Back for More. Who are you? And why am I so excited to have you? <laughs> well, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Anthony Palmozzi, also known as Tony Mosey. So uh, I'm a social media influencer first. So you would probably see some of my stuff on YouTube, some of my content there. I am a former U.S. Army uh, soldier, so I'm a veteran. I worked in psychology for my primary career with my education as well in that. And I went to a software boot camp, got my first job as a sales engineer, loved the idea of what a sales engineer is as it uh, took what I did previously to what I am doing currently. And around that time, I had met Ramsey Marjaba. Uh, I reached out to him on Slack. I, he was on another networking group and uh, was picking his mind and really fostering the relationship. And he seemed to take a liking to me. And uh, two years ago, I believe, was when we first met. And yeah. here we are still today. I'm just pretending to take a liking to you. Uh, <laughs> no, uh, you are my friend. So I get to tease you today a little bit more than usual. And uh, SE Nation, that's where we met, I think. Right? Yes. Actually, you commented quite a bit on my YouTube videos. And then you reached out and said, hey, I'm the guy who comments. I'm the only person who comments on your YouTube videos. So I appreciate that. But it's a good place to network if you're looking to become an SE. SE Nation is a great place to network with great founders. So, all right. Last time we, you were on the show, it was more of a coaching session, right? Like we kind of, you asked me your questions. I helped you out. Two years later... Now you're here. Now it's taken a long time and you came from a psychology background. Why did you go into the boot camp to begin with the uh, like coding boot camp? Yeah. So, you know, I was working in that, in the field of psychology. I got my bachelor's in it. I was working with children and adolescents. And uh, these were kids who were, you know, severely, you know, they had severe psychiatric and behavioral health issues, you know, behavioral issues. And as much as the job was rewarding, I did not like the system that they were a part of. Uh, you know, I didn't didn't really get much freedom, and the way it was, the way they went about things just was not helping these children or even patients overall. Because I worked also with adults as well in that area, it just you know was 
setting them up for like a revolving door. They just kept coming back. And I eventually started, I got burnt out. So I had my bachelor's in that, worked in the hospital. When I got my master's degree, I worked for six months as an in-home therapist. And, you know, I think I was saying, hey, let me try this out. Let's see what, how this looks now in the master's level. Uh, now going into people's homes. So it's totally different a totally different animal where now you have to go in their house and sometimes you have to extract kids out of the house as well, you know, put it called the call the police and then, you know, do all this paperwork and all this, you have to see, you have to literally like in, immerse yourself in that. And it's, uh, that was when I got really, you know, I got, I, that's, that was the, the, the straw that broke the camel's back. And I said, you know what, I'm going to get out of this thing. Uh, so I drove, I met up with this individual. I was dating her. Uh, she, had worked in you know, tech startups and she's been working in customer success. All the all her peers, all her friends, her colleagues, they all were software developers. And she said, hey, you know, I know you're trying to figure things out at this moment. You're driving Lyft, you're driving Uber. You know, I did that for two years in the mid in the middle before between psychology and tech. She said, hey, you know, I know you're driving Lyft and Uber and you're just trying to figure it out, but you're also enjoying the fact that you're not no longer in this previous industry that's exhausting you but i think you should check out a software boot camp you'll you know it's a program for three months once you get out you could become a software developer or that could help position you to be somewhere in tech you know so because now you have a foundation of how software is built so i said okay cool so i attended general assembly uh this was a 12-week course and it was a full stack web development program and after I graduated six within six months, I got a job at this SaaS company. You know, they sold 25 different SaaS products. And uh, right around the time when I was getting, when I was looking for jobs, because I was looking just, phys, just uh, narrow. I was looking at software developer, software engineer, front end engineer, full stack uh, engineer. A director from this tech company reached out to me, you know, director of SEs. And he said, hey, I see your background. You know, I'm former military, former army. They said, I see that. I see you got psychology. And I see you just graduated from a software boot camp. Uh, how about you come check us out and, you know, uh, as a sales engineer? And I'm like, okay, sales engineer. What the heck is that? You know, what is a sales engineer? You know, I, I mean, I didn't know what the hell it was. But, you know, at that time, I was, you know, looking for, for a job. And I said, you know what? Let's try this out. So, from the interview, you know, meeting the team and, and then hearing more about it and doing my research, I started noticing that there were components of what I was already doing and what I was current, what I was then doing, you know, so the psychology aspect, uh, you know, also in the midst of my Uber driving, I was doing a little digital marketing. Hence, that's why I was telling people that I'm a, you know, a little bit of a social media influencer. I was helping uh, self-published authors with marketing their books by doing uh rapping music videos uh summarizing nonfiction books so okay. it could even be chris white's book you know it was books like that that i was like uh doing music videos for uh, uh, i'd love so to hear a rap about chris white's book yeah i know you he, just put yourself he, in the corner and now i'm gonna have to hear it he, he asked me that him and, and uh peter cohen <laughs> <laughs> nice so you know with the psychology you know a little bit of sales uh, me being savvy about business because I was already trying to build my own small business. My parents also had built a pest control business growing up. Uh, it was called a right. &R, Anthony and Ray, my dad, Ray, Anthony and Ray's budget pest control. So seeing all that together, I'm like, all right, I have these components. I also, I just have this newfound skill of putting together web applications. And even when I was working with children, I did a lot of workshops, which involved public speaking, presentations, you know, demonstrations, if you want to say. And I said, you know what? This sounds interesting. I mean, I know it's a new crevice uh, of my of my career, but uh, I want to I want to see how this works. So uh, went to the company. I loved how everything worked, you know, enterprise level, working cross-functionally with everything go to market, if that's the word, because it's everything from business development, marketing, sales, sales engineer, once you get the POC, customer success, I just love how that whole ecosystem works. Uh, so it was really cool to really pick everyone's brain, including the software developers. I just knew that that wasn't going to be the company I was going to stay at, you know, that I knew that I would thrive at. 
So then, you know, I'll, I'll stop there right here. So this is, this is, this was where my, my, my career started. Okay. All right. Many questions. Yes. <clears throat> so I'm curious, you were doing psychology, you were burnt out of doing something specific. Why didn't you, why was the choice to go into a totally different industry versus finding something within psychology that works for you? Because I'm sure the decision to go into a totally different industry and drive, drive Uber and Lyft, it would have been a little bit scarier than just finding something else within that industry that even though you're not in love with it, just would make you more money than driving Uber or Lyft. Sure. I mean, you know, depending on what you get into in psychology, it could be a lucrative, uh, uh, you know, uh, venture, you know? Um, but the thing is with psychology, I made the mistake because I went in for a, with a, ma a master's in general psychology. So it's a master's of arts. I had put out a video on YouTube called the four reasons why I quit being a social worker, but I must preface this, that I do not have a social work uh, licensure. Uh, my intention was to become a professor. I was going to teach either social psychology or just general psychology, you know, either in a community college or, you know, state university. Uh, but then I started Ask, you know, I, I wanted to make some money as well. You know, it's, it's one thing I have a heart for helping people and inspiring. That's great value. But I also need to not just pay the bills. I also want to be able to thrive and, and do other things. And so I did not get that social worker licensure. So that definitely hindered me from being able to get into any more uh, areas of, of psychology. Uh, so I, 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 you know, I try to apply for jobs in the midst of that, you know, be right before making that jump into saying, all right, I'm going to leave the field. I was applying and a lot of them were saying, hey, man, you need this licensure. You know, all my peers were like, yeah, I already got the licensure. This has opened a lot of doors. You know, they're starting off making salaries of $80,000, which sounds like tech, 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 tech industry uh, in, uh, entry level numbers right there. You know, 80,000 all the way up to 150K. And I'm like, damn, I wish I went to that school. But I was just so burnt out working so many years in that industry that I'm like, I'm not going back to school. And the problem is with that, they, if you're not smart and savvy, they'll put you on this treadmill where it's like, oh, get a licensure for this, get a licensure for that. But it's not necessarily focusing on the, the place where you, you need to be to make that money. Because I know a lot of people who are getting all these little licensures and they're still making 40K. And, uh, you know, it, it's it's about you being, like, smart enough for that. But, uh, yeah, I, I just said to myself, um, I, I, I can't. I don't want to go any for any more schooling. And I saw how quickly people were getting a, you know, tech degree with either sometimes a high school degree, but definitely, like, an associate's degree, a bachelor's degree, maybe you getting a tech job. Tech, tech, tech job. job. Tech yeah. job, yeah. Getting a certification or going to, like, a boot camp like this. And then three months later, pow, they got a job. So yeah. I'm like, well, I'd rather take the faster route. Okay. All right. So in terms of the boot camp, the web development boot camp, for me, like when, when I see, I don't know what goes on into it because I've never been part of it. Is the plan that you would know how to code right after you graduate or know enough to interview well? Yeah. So the idea is like, you you know, these co most companies, at least from what they told us, they know that we're coming out of this boot camp. We're still very green. So it's, you know, it's about like, as long as you have the, at least some foundational, then you could build up from there. Uh, it's kind of like, you know, the same idea of like what I'm doing now at the current company with the whole idea of I go through, I went through an academy and we, they put you in the inside to, you know, just get, go at bats, get those repetitions in because yep. they know, Hey, you're just, you just started learning this, but you could just expand from there. Okay. So, uh, you kind of mentioned what you're like, your Currently, you went to an academy, but before that, you were an SE at a company that you knew wasn't going to be the company for you. What happened in between those two times? Um, uh, and again, can can you repeat that again? Just because I I was just trying to fix my uh, microphone so everybody can hear me. <laughs> that never <laughs> happens. So right after, like you got you you did the boot camp, you became an SE uh, at a company that you knew wasn't going to be your company long term. What did you do in between that and? going into the getting a job and being part of the the jobs academy yeah so this was like my first time in tech i never knew what the role was let alone what tech was right so this was allowing me to take a step back and really just try to see a little bit more from that whole go to market as i, I think that's i don't know what's the, the actual i keep saying end to end go to market because it's going from the business development all the way to professional services customer success but 
I wanted to take a little bit of a, a step back. And fortunately, what came on my plate was this company that does business business development as a service. Okay. Uh, and they work with many, they're contracted to work with many tech tech companies, uh, some of them non-technical. I was very fortunate to be on three different, you know, projects uh, that were all like SaaS, uh, SaaS based, but it allowed me to, you know, be able to work as a business development rep, but then work cross-functionally with the account executive or sales rep and the sales engineer. And then sometimes even work further out into like, you know, marketing and other aspects of the company. Uh, so it allowed me to just figure out like, okay, where do I really, where's my real home here? But as I kept working through, you know, at the, the from that time, from the last, the first tech company to where I'm at today, I was doing business development. So yeah. cool calling, oh. cold outreach, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So we're going to dig into a little bit more what BDR stands for. But right. I get a lot of questions from people it's like, hey, I want to be an SE. Should I go be, do, be a BDR first? Is it a doorway into sales engineering? And my answer is usually no. Uh, although you're kind of proof of the opposite. Well, or maybe you're an exception to, maybe you're the rule, maybe you're the exception to the rule. And that's the question I wanted to ask. Like, one, is BDR a gateway to sales engineering? We could philosophize on that and say yes. Uh, but if we look at, Ooh, uh, if we look at objective, that. yeah, no, but if we look at objective data, uh, it, I would say no, because it's a very small, very small percentage of people who go from the BDR to, Okay. You know? okay. Yeah. Well, it's a different set of skills altogether, right? Um, which is why I say it. So maybe we should step back and explain what what business development representative is, otherwise known as sales development representative or SDR. So can you take a second to explain what that is? Yeah. So BDR, SDR. I mean, sometimes they could be interchangeable. At my job or the previous uh, job that I was at, uh, you know, business development reps, sales development reps. They're kind of like the first line. They're like the the people who start the sales process. Like yeah. they're the ones who are they are the face of the company because they're the we're the introduction as to what the product is. Yeah. Uh, you know the 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 role. You know sometimes it comes from marketing. Sometimes it comes from business development. Like how we do, do those touch points on you know meaning like who's the first person that actually gets in front of the customer that pros, prospective customer's face. Uh, but essentially, the business development rep is doing the cold calls, the cold emails, the cold LinkedIn's, you know, basically trying to position this product for the customer in the customer's eyes for them to perhaps consider purchasing. So if anyone's interested in learning more about that, I can bring Tony back on and we can discuss that position uh, solely. But maybe we can summarize it in this way. What are some of the things you liked about being a BDR and some of the things that you disliked about it? So I was just thinking about it today because I'm very passionate about a lot of things. If I emer if I find something interesting, I'm passionate about it. Yeah. Uh, I found being a BDR passionate. I was I'm still passionate about psychology because psychology is just everything in the world, you know. Uh, and I'm passionate what about what I'm doing now at Dell Technologies as a, you know in IT and data, you know, with with that whole infrastructure. And I'm just still familiarizing myself. So. I don't want people to get it twisted. Like this is what I want to do, you know, BDR. No, it's just that I did it for about two years and I found, I found enjoyment in an aspect. Didn't want to necessarily do it for the rest of my career, but I found, I found meaning within it, you know, and the whole idea like was uh, BDR, you know, what I enjoyed about being a BDR was connecting with people. I, you know, I also gamified it a little bit, you know, it, 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 a lot of people are fear, fearful of rejection, I guess, you know, I guess that's what they, from what they say, fearful of heights, fearful of public speaking, fearful of rejection. I don't even know how the list goes, but I loved it. I loved being able to just call people and just, you know, it was never their fault why they hung up. I made it my onus. I made it my responsibility why they would hang up or why they wouldn't listen or why they want to take a meeting. Uh, I made it an own. I made it a thing, you know, to be like, hey, you know, let's figure out this person's really a fit or what I'm saying. My messaging is not necessarily fitting this person, this persona. You know, I, I enjoyed all that. You know, that was really good. I, I said to myself, I know I'm not going to be in this this role for my whole career but let's make the best out of it until then you know and uh yeah just i love being able to just call random people people who don't know me i don't even know them and <laughs> convince them why this product should be in their portfolio 
Yeah. And what did you not enjoy about it? Like, what are the uh, downsides that people should pay attention to? Yeah. You, you, you know, washing dishes, uh, uh, washing, doing laundry, um, uh, sitting there, having to write postcards for your hundred friends and family, you know, folding clothes. Those are like mundane tasks. And BDR, you can, it can end up being, becoming very mundane. Okay. I'm not, you know, I'm a guy that, and you know, there becomes a point where you, you know, the, it becomes consistent. You hit a point of mastery and it's just very like flat to me. Like, that's it. Like you now, I even try to challenge myself more to be like, all right, well, what else can I do besides this? You know, I now know the messaging for talking to a director. I know a messaging for talking to someone who's in software development, someone who's a manufacturer, someone who's a sourcing engineer. I'm I'm, I'm fine tuning these things. It's great. I'm hitting the point of mastery. But what else can I do that can make larger influence, that can make more of an impact? And I don't know, this becomes a point where, you know, it was either the next step up was going to be management, right? And, you know, where now I'm like looking at something a little bit, you know, bigger and broader helping the company out as well as, you know, those under me. But I, it, it became mundane. It just became repetitive. And I'm just like, man, like, this is, this is not where I want to be. It's like, it's very kind of droning out, very, uh, you know, you, you, you almost get mind numb by doing it. And I would say that's the one thing I did, I, I did not like. Okay. So uh, last question about this topic. Yes. If you're not making calls, like as SEs, we we do a lot of work. Like we have to study, we have to learn. We're meeting customers, whatever. If you're as an SDR, if you're not making calls, what else are you doing? Making email, sending emails. Okay, so you're, it's all about like, <laughs> like, like LinkedIn. Okay. Yeah. All right. Updating so, your Salesforce. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought you were updating your LinkedIn. Uh, <laughs> so last time when we talked on the show, it was back in March 2021. And people tell me like, oh, how long will it take me to get an SE job? And the answer is as long as it takes, mm. right? Especially it all depends on where they are in their journey. Like if you already have technical know-how, if you already have sales experience and it took you quite a while to become an SE. And one thing I would say like the Tony strength, the Anthony strength is that you never gave up on anything. You've had your ups, you've had your downs. We talk about it and you like push through and you're finally here. So two years is, well, you started, you became an SE. Well, you became part of the Academy at Dell a while back. It's not like yesterday, right? It's been like six months. Uh, it's been about eight months now. Eight, okay. Nine. So let's say a year and a half till you got the opportunity to prove yourself as an SE. What are some of the challenges that you faced in that year and a half until you got this first opportunity yeah was it a year and a half i keep thinking it's two well when if I... we talked in march well last time we talked you might have been starting to look for roles before so it might have been two right before like maybe six months before you and i started talking but from when we talked we talked in march you got it eight months ago so yeah um if i'm doing yeah. the math correctly let's let's say a year and, and six months and a half we split the difference <laughs> Yeah, no, because uh, I had left that uh, that first technical company okay. uh, in 2020 of January, of February. Okay, uh, well, uh, so it took you a long time to get, it doesn't really matter if it's uh, like six, eight months, a year and a half or two months, but it took you a long time. And most people come to me, it's like, hey, I want to get a job in three months. And well, that's the interview process, right? Uh, so what what were the challenges that you faced in those two years and to get to where you are today? You know, I have to laugh about this because, oh man, when I hear some people's stories and I talk to them like, oh, I haven't gotten a job and it's three weeks. I haven't gotten a job and it's three months or six months. And I'm like, it took me two years, two years. Yeah. And so when I hear people that they haven't gotten a job in three months, I mean, come on, man. It takes time sometimes for certain people. Granted, yes, so there's some success stories and there's that whole survivorship bias Yep. Oh, that one person got it in a month. So that means I can too. No, I mean, and I guess maybe I'm also an anomaly, although I know a couple of the SEs, but the, the trials and tribulations for me, I mean, again, this is my journey. Two years for me may not be the same for everyone else. Well, but my you had journey, a lot of attacks against you specifically. Let's yes. be honest. Like you had a lot, you didn't have, you did a boot camp. Mm -hmm. You didn't have uh, 
like technical know-how in in many industries and you weren't like you were an SDR it's just a lot of people who get a job within a month or two months are usually the people who are like already SEs right you are they're trying to they're already technical they're working for a big company and someone wants someone there so there's a lot of luck you had no luck right and you had a lot of things stacked against you so all right let, let's talk what are some of the things that you faced um my you know the fact that i had a lot of a uh, lot of years more years in psychology um perhaps it's also uh, i guess i'll say it out loud but it's my age perhaps i don't know there's rumors about all this stuff age race i mean i heard all these things oh you know uh you know yeah yeah your age race you know the fact that i was in psychology more those were like the top three pillars that people would be like well I heard this company did, you know, doesn't do this for these kinds of people and blah, blah, blah. So I was like, eventually I started to feed into it. And I'm like, man, really? So it's these things. I'm, that's what's hindering me. Uh, but at least I will give it to them to say, hey, you know, um, I did not have the techno technical experience. And that could be kind of a liability for companies. Although I would look sometimes left and right. And I'd be like, whoa, this person had no technical experience. And here they are moving into this company. Uh, but those were the three things that were definitely stacked against me. I would also say too, let's look at something a little more personally. Uh, I come from the, the the military, of course, too, where I come from that time where it's like, you know, you, you, you're in the military, even when you go into the civilian place, you conduct yourself very like proper with this whole military decorum. And uh, I would kind of come off, you know, in a sense, like I'm a little bit of a robot. I had no personality. Sometimes I'm like, I want to make sure that I'm dotting my T's, crossing my I's metaphorically or dotting my T's crossing my eyes with how I pronounce things and everything like that. So I would be more focused about how I'm presenting myself than actually coming across as like an, uh, uh, you know, a human being that you could work with. So I can see that as well. That was yeah. like what was hindering me. So I definitely take that, uh, that responsibility knowing that, Hey, you know, at least some of it was me, if not a lot, I don't know, but I'll, well, I'll give I, I think I figured out the issue. You've been yes. trying to dot your T's and cross your eyes. Yes. Well, can I tell you this story real quick? Yeah. I'm gonna. I don't know if I should say his name, but he's a manager at AWS. He's a friend of mine. Uh, he's in, in the SE nation, or you know, he's part of the SE group. And you know, I told him I'm like, "Yo, man," I was like, "Dude, why am I not getting these jobs?" You know, or he's like, "I'm noticing you're not getting these jobs and all that stuff like that. You're not getting, dude. You're more than capable. You're, a, you're, you know, you're just blah 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 blah. You're served in the military. Who would not want to hire you?" And then he wanted to assess. And he said, let me ask you some questions. And when he asked me some questions, he figured out it was def he was he would say, I would I think it's because you're coming into these interviews wanting everything to be perfect and you want to win. How about this? Let me change it. Let's change this around, Anthony. How about you come to these interviews knowing you lost? How about no? He said, How about you come to these interviews knowing that you failed? And I don't know why, Ramsey, but that really blew my mind because I didn't think like that. I never thought I was like, you got to come in, make sure everything's good, crisp, clean and clear. Look at these people that said, study this, do this, da, da, da. And I never thought about that kind of paradigm, like to come in knowing that I failed. I mean, I guess it just brought a different uh, disposition well, to the interviews. Okay. So, yeah, uh, the, we don't do interviews often, right? We do interviews every once in a while. So when you start off, you do things wrong and then you get better. My question, I guess, right now is why most people don't even get interviews, especially if, like from your background, you have no, no reason to actually get an interview. Why do you think you were, because you got a lot of interviews. Why do you think you were getting a lot of interviews? So, I mean, I'll say I'm thankful. I did get a lot of at least first interviews, second round interviews, sometimes five, seven round interviews. Some some companies do seven rounds, of course. Uh, I was getting interviews. So clearly they liked my, you know, they liked what I put on my cover letter. They loved my resume. And then they loved how I at least did the behavioral interview, like how I conducted myself. Uh, it was within the technical interviews that that, that was where, here's what I noticed, Uh Hey, we, we found someone who has experience in this either sliver or general thing. We have somebody, you know, who has been a subject matter expert for a significantly longer time, or we decided to pivot and just go internally. So I've been, I, it, I think what also held me back was that there was people who had some more time than me, uh, yeah. basically. 
but okay going back to why you got so many interviews i'm gonna give you my theory because you sure. talked about your resume and your cover letter i think you got interviews because you were able to connect with a tremendous amount of people not only connect with a tremendous amount of people you even offered value to those people like for me for example you offered to help me and whatever right you would look over my videos and send me like hey ramsey you had the wrong tag here wrong tag there uh, seny you helped them as uh, out as well uh, if i recall correctly like and you chris white you talked to many people and many people because they liked you were rooting for you so you did this tremendous amount of work of just reaching out to as many people as possible. And you reached out to me after you commented on my YouTube videos. You didn't come out of the blue, right? Uh, and maybe others don't have YouTube video, YouTube channels so you, people can comment on, but you can still reach out to people and comment on their LinkedIn posts, comment on whatever, and build that network. And after you built that network, you were not overbearing. You were not asking for stuff all the time. You were asking for feedback. You were asking for help, but you were asking like, hey, Ramsey, can you... Uh, can you introduce me to that person over there? Or, hey, uh, Clive, can you do that for me? No, you were offering as much help as you were asking for. And now you made everyone like you. You forced everyone to, I didn't want to like you. I don't know why, but you forced people to like you. And I guess, I don't know, this is an, inter I'm interviewing you, but this is what I saw over the, our two year relationship. Because you forced people to like you, people were rooting for you. And like, I, I got you interviews, right? Akshat from SENY probably got you interviews. People were referring you all the time, right? And pe many people that I don't, I don't even know, you were, you, your network is probably bigger than mine, which is weird to say. <laughs> but you did that, right? And that's what I'm trying to get to right now for people who want to... Yes, your resume... If your resume is horrible, someone refers you. And your resume is horrible, they're going to bypass you, right? If your resume is acceptable, they'll still talk to you. If your resume is good, they would love to talk to you. But it's the referral that's most important. So if people are looking for an SE job, whether they're experienced, whether they're, they don't even know what SE means. If you don't know what SE means, you should research. If you build your network and get people to like you, get people to root for you, provide value to those people, you will get the opportunities. Now, Things will happen during the opportunity. It doesn't mean you're guaranteed a job. Like you were not, you went through interviews. Several of the ones that I referred you to, you got to the end and you either had an account manager who said, oh, I want someone with that sort of experience, right? Or the SE manager said, oh, that, you know, we need, we found someone a little bit better here or there. That's a different story, but at least you got there. That's the hur biggest hurdle is getting there. And I don't know, I think you did a very good job with that. So what are your thoughts? Is my theory on the right track after talking for a half hour? Yeah, no, because the, you, I want to bring this up to the people who are watching, to, who are listening, who are trying to get in the field and or those who are just starting, you know, they're actually in, it's their first year or whatever. And they forget this. They forget this thing because I know some peer, I have some peers of mine who just got into the role and they got to know this moving forward, man. Networking is the best thing to do is most it's it should be number one on your list uh like two things you should network and do it in the manner where you are a go-to-market person yourself you are marketing yourself you're doing the cold outreach as a business development person you know doing those quick pitches and all that stuff like that then once you finally meet have them on a meeting you're the account executive trying to sell yourself who's the product and then also you know within the interview you're this you're being the sales engineer during the technical and then you know, it's uh, it's all about taking all those components and then being able to close. Uh, but networking is super invaluable uh, because, you know, it's going to help you not just get a job. That's the problem. I think people's aperture, the the their their scope of how they see things, it's very uh, it's very uh, it's not very visionary thinking. They're like they're just all about let me message and you can tell that these people are just doing it just to get something for themselves you know i think it was a john f kennedy quote but there's plenty of other ones that talk about it even the book called the go giver but it's all about just giving value give value give value just like gary vaynerchuk with the jab 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 right hook <laughs> book but you know like it's about giving value and like you know again like I decided, yes, it was networking, selling myself, but also remember that it's not all about me. It's about, it's about the people who I'm, you know, I'm connecting with. 
can, can I ask you this? Like, I have a YouTube channel. You provide value by kind of helping me with my YouTube channel, right? Uh, SENY has SENY. You help, you provided value by helping them with that. If it's just someone you found on LinkedIn, what value can someone who's trying to break into sales engineering offer someone who is already a sales engineer in general? Like, have you, can you give me an example of something like that? Something that's kind of surface level. If you yeah. connect with someone on LinkedIn and they're a sales engineer, at least the first touch point would be to react to their things, like comment, share. If you find it useful, at least do that without having to feel like you have to come up with your own posts or whatever, because it's at least giving value in that manner. It's also showing that you're supporting this individual. So that's like the first touch point there. The next thing after you, while, you know, after you built some kind of like touch point with that, you could then message them and be like, Hey, I really appreciate your content. I was wondering if I can, you know, get on a 30 minute call or a half hour call, or whatever, just to talk to you about this role, because I'm really interested in it. And I would, you know, potentially like to be in it, but it's not until after you've given value in that manner, like comment, reach, you know, share, uh, they're going to see it. And they're gonna be like, wow, this person constantly commenting, constantly liking, even sharing it, man, that's great. Cause if you just come in cold and say, Hey, I just added you. I want you to get on the uh, phone with me. I want you to get on a Zoom with me and talk to me about this. It's just like selfish. I'm sorry. People got to stop being selfish. You got to give first before you receive. So if you, if there's someone you like that you want to connect with, I would say before you maybe check out their profile and see if they post. It's right. easier. So it's much easier to connect with someone who's already putting themselves out there because they want to build their network, obviously. Otherwise, they wouldn't put themselves out there than someone who hasn't been on LinkedIn in like six months. Right. I mean, okay, so here's what I'm thinking. If someone's highly influential, if they're of a stature that's high up there, say, you know, they, I don't know, I could come up with some SEs who are, they're just, you. Uh, the guy that you have who works on AWS now, I believe, is a former Air Force Airman guy. Trevor, 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 Trevor Spires. Trevor, I mean, anybody who's like grown to a certain level in their SE career is going to be leveraging LinkedIn. So I'm, I'm not, not going to reject this idea that you just said. But anybody who I want to connect with who's of influence is going to be pretty active on, on, on social media. So if I don't see him on LinkedIn, I, you know, I found Trevor off of, I think, YouTube, I believe. Yeah. You know, I was there and he's like, oh, shoot, yeah, you're on LinkedIn. And then, you know, I found other people off of Twitter, you know, and then LinkedIn. So I try to research these people. Again, this is like another BDR thing. I research yeah. these people and see what they do, what they talk about, use as a conversational piece and try to help support them in that. Nice. Um, we only have 10 minutes left. I am very curious. So you got the job. You went through interviews. You got rejected a bunch. And you all you need is one off, right? And you got it. And we can dig into this a lot more. Has it been smooth sailing since you started your new job? No. It's funny because I've been... Uh, at this company for about uh, eight, I think going on nine months. And granted, I went through the academy. I'm just getting started. Like next month, I start my career in the inside. This is when I'm actually going to be the SE, you know? Uh, so I'm just starting. And even then, even from beginning to end, it was a very arduous journey. Very, like I've met a lot of challenges because uh, I didn't necessarily know the lingo coming off the street of what IT data center and hardware, you know, all that infrastructure is, you know, I'm coming mainly from SaaS and everybody, when they think of SE, you know, pre-sales are thinking of SaaS, but you also have SEs in manufacturing. Likewise, you have SEs in IT uh, and, and data centers. So it was a very new language for me and, uh, you know, drinking from my fire hose, as they would always say, in, in every one of these uh, beginning parts of your career. And uh, yeah, man, I was met with a lot of challenges. Uh, but, you know, again, it all helped for the for, to where I'm at right now. Yeah. Well, you used the Tony superpower. of. <laughs> uh, okay. I think what you, one of your superpowers is okay, the result is that you don't give up. But I think your biggest thing is your capability, your ability to ask for help. Right. Now, a lot of people are afraid to ask for help. They don't want to look bad. They don't want to look stupid. You don't mind either. <laughs> I mean, that the best way possible. You don't mind, like you don't care. You will ask for help for you to succeed. And that's someone, that's something people should uh, aspire to actually do. And Tony, like any anything you wanted to talk about that I didn't 
I, I didn't prompt you. Is there anything you want to mention? Oh man, we could talk about a lot of things. Um, I think. I know. I think- Yeah. The thing I wanted to touch on was the last thing you said, you know, not giving up, but uh, also looking for help. So here's this thing, man, I've carried, especially since coming in tech, is the word humility. Just coming in humble, really leaving my pride at the door. Yes, I know I have this personality and I can, you know, I have speak with a very uh, voluminous uh, vocal tone or whatever. I'm just passionate. So don't confuse that. Just passionate. So sometimes my voice can get loud. But uh Regardless, though, when it comes to the tech stuff, I really do leave my pride at the door. And I know that there's people out in with even within my company who know way better, who are a lot smarter, who are a lot more savvy. And so I just still keep that upon me to be like, you know, there's one thing, just like Socrates said, he said, there's one thing that I do know, and that is I know nothing. And so I try to come in with that very like, you know, that infant sensory, just trying to like learn everything I can, because there's a lot of things I do not know. So leaving my pride at the door, having that humility to know that, hey, I still have a lot to learn. Uh, that's why, the, that's the reason why I like go and reach out to people for support. Yeah. I mean, I think there's another saying that reflect that. The more I learn, the less I know. Mm. Right. Um, so yeah. Okay. Man. That's, that's a perfect way to end this uh, show. Tony, I'm very proud to have you here. Very proud of you. And uh, I look forward to seeing the rest of your journey. Thank you, Ramsey. Appreciate your time. Thank you, Anthony, for coming on, giving us your honest feedback, your honest experience in becoming an SE. I hope anyone listening took something out of this call. There was a lot of nuggets. I'm not going to state them all. Just know that if you keep working and you're not desperate, you'll find a job. Don't quit. You'll find a way. And that's it. I hope I hope to see you next time. Let's just leave it at that. So with that, I'm signing off.